time that way, I'll go early here in the hallway. But uh, your decisions, you know, you sleep on your preparation for a part, just let it sink into you. And, and a lot of, like a lot of inventors, I get, I get quite a few ideas in, in my sleep. And, uh, but yeah, so now, and, and, and the same thing with uh, law school. You know, when I was in law school, uh, I had to drive to the library and go in and get the ladder and climb the stacks and reach for the book and there's an empty space where the book is. And then I'd have to go down and, and wander around the library, ooh, and find the book. And say, oh, can I, can I have that when you're finished? Yeah, yeah. So when my son went through law school, his research was with the mops. Wow. Can you imagine driving to the library to read a book? All the time that you save just by being able to do it with the mouse. I mean, it's just like, wow. I would have learned a lot more if I had, <laughs> I had that mouse, you know, because there, I have to be honest with you, there are times where, do I drive to the library or do I watch a TV show? <laughs> you know, what do I do? So, uh, but, uh, yeah, the business is is a, a very a very wonderful place to spend your adult life, you know, your professional life, if you can get enough work. And uh, Hollywood, and now it's all over. It, you know, it breaks a lot of people's hearts, which is very, you know, which is very sad. But um, I have some friends and relatives who would say, "Well, you, can you get me into the business?" And I say, "You really don't want to do this. If if you if you have it in your blood." You know, if this is something that just drives you, and this is you have a need to do it, uh, it may, I would I would say go for it. You know, and follow your dream. But you know, if you want to be a movie star, or if you want to just you know, say I think that would be nice. Because I remember years ago when we were going to college, and people didn't know what they were going to do. They decided I think I'll teach. I don't know if that still goes on now, <laughs> but that's what they used to say. I don't know, I don't know what I'll do. I guess I'll teach, like the default profession. Um, but I, as I say, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, you, you know, you gotta be good, you gotta be lucky, you gotta be the right place, right time, just all of those things together. Because I know, I know a lot of wonderful actors in, in, in Hollywood who can't make a living. I mean, terrific actors, and you see them in, in plays. You know, we've all done free plays because you love, because you just love what you do. And um, so, you know, you, sometimes you can go to a theater and see astounding work, and, you go backstage and talk to the person and they, they say, well, you know, I'm working at Starbucks. But, uh, but you, you have to, you know, you have to be known. Now it's easier to be known because of YouTube. You know, you can, you can, you can kind of like send your stuff out there and let people see how good you are on YouTube. But with my, when I first started, I was lucky to get in three auditions a year. You know, you're doing cold, sending out your pictures, just old pictures, sending them out all over town, and not getting any responses, and looking in drama log, and trying to find, you know, working for free at, 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 uh, at the little theaters, and, and, and really, really sacrificing. And especially like Steve Blue was saying, you know, if you have a family, that's a real tough one. You know, if it's just you, Heck, you just live in your car and you're fine, you know, for, say, it's only going to last for a short period. I can do this, but if you have a family depending on your children, depending on you, that makes it you know, just a, a real tough nut to crack to try to pursue your dream and at the same time uh, provide, provide for your family. And, uh, as I say, I was just uh, immensely lucky to uh, have had the opportunities that I had um, to, to make a living as an actor doing what I love. It's just, it's such a blessing to, to do what you love. I mean, I, as I say, I've done it for free. <laughs> I've done a lot of stuff for free. I used to go to the clubs and sing, and, and uh, they would, the, 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 it's not really the casting director, but he would, I'll call him casting director. He would, he would get the singers and go to a club and say, okay, um, they want to showcase their work. And so we would get free entertainment. I mean, for, it was free for the club. And so they would have entertainment, we wouldn't get paid. So, so much of what we did was just gratis, because we, you know, just trying to get yourself known in, in, in Hollywood. But it, once again, it's, you know, the difference between Hollywood and New York, at least back when I started, was New York, you can, you can kind of like peddle yourself. You know, you can, you can go down and submit yourself and, 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 and knock on doors and stuff, but in Hollywood, you 
got to, you know, you have to have an agent. I have an agent. I have a manager. I have, well, I have several agents. You know, I have a, a, a voiceover commercial agent, and I have a, a theatrical agent, and I have a manager, and on and off I have a close assist. Um, and once again, now because the secrecy is so severe in Hollywood that everything is using a code name. You know, even when I did Star Trek. Um, we drive the, I drive this MGM bus, it's Sony now. I drive the Sony, and uh, you know, we had a code. And so, um, ST was never used, the, the words were never used. And uh, we, uh, we were using three different sound stages, uh, in which were away from our dressing rooms and makeup. And so, we would uh, get made up and get in costume, and they gave us these capes. Uh, from head to toe with hoods, so that when we were out on the studio lot, nobody could see our costumes. And the, the way the two, uh, one of the sound stages we were using, it was like a combined sound stage, and there were bathrooms that both sound stages used. So to go to the bathroom, you had to go out to go to the bathroom and go in like that. So whenever you had to go, you had to get the cape and you know, this whole thing, you know. It's like, and sometimes you just. You know, so you been crossing my legs, <laughs> trying to trying to bend it off. But um, yeah, the the uh, the, uh, the experience the experience now is, is is so different and so secretive. I think I mentioned that uh, we have to sign the non-disclosure agreements very often just to audition. <coughs> But they use code names anyway. So if, if I was going to tell somebody, I just auditioned for Whiskey, which was which was a code name for one of the show I, I just did. Um, nobody would know what it was anyway. But it's like that, 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 that double fail-safe thing to, to keep their project um, safe, so it's nobody will steal their ideas or, or steal their steal their concept. Uh, but it's. Uh, I've tried to hold on to my uh, excitement about Hollywood. You know, when you first go to some places, it's like Hollywood. You know, I'm looking at the Hollywood sign, and, and of course, like, whenever you live in a place, the only way you sightsee is when somebody comes to visit. Right? So my cousin came last year. My cousin came from Colorado, went to Universal Studios, to the Hollywood sign, and Beverly Hills, and you know, all the Rodeo Drive, and down Santa Monica to the beach, and all, all of that. And uh, I was telling my wife, and I got one of those maps to the stars' house, houses, which is, I, you know, I was, I don't know if I was a snob or what, I said, I, and I, well, I don't make it a dog with a map to the stars' house, and then I got into it. And, <laughs> but it was, it was like the, the older stars for me, you know, like, uh, what happened to Lou Costello who lived, lived there, and Edward G. Robinson lived in that house, and uh, there's this one place in Lexington where uh, Lucia Ball, you know Lucia Ball, right, because Lucia, but Lucia Ball lived there, Jack Benny lived next to her, and across the street right next to her was um, uh, Jimmy Stewart. And, um, and a block down was uh, uh, Mel Ferrer and, um, and his wife. But so anyway, I got, in, I got into looking at the house with all of these ancient stars. And probably, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about when I say Jack <laughs> Benny. But, you know, but, uh, but you know they do the same thing for the more recent stars, and I. But so back, see, but back in those days, the stars that lived in houses, you can drive by and see the house. But now, everybody lives behind gates, so that you know you can go back like in Playboy Mansion. You know, you, you drive it only only hills, and you drive it there in mansion, but you can't see anything because it's all down the long drive, and there are trees and everything. Years ago. With the Hollywood stars, they're just like available. I mean, their homes are available, so you can go and look and see where Edward G. Robinson lived, or where J uh, Jimmy Stewart, and all those, those people. Anyway, it's, I'm kind of share my Hollywood experience, my uh, um, my emotions of, 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 of uh, still being excited about what I'm doing, where I'm living, walking the same steps. You know, or looking at Marilyn Monroe's uh, handprints and footprints at Brownman's Chinese Theater, uh, it's uh, it's still it's still exciting for me.
kind of a work. Do you have to pay for your like payments and things like that? Do you feel like you pay them every month? Or do they do you pay them when they find you work, or do you just have to automatically are they all on staff? They, they no, no. They get a cut of the tape when I work. Right. They're not on retainer where I pay them every week for their work. So they do a lot of work for no pay. <laughs> you know, because no matter how successful you are, you still have a, 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 a great, um, a lot of rejection where, you know, where you don't get the gig. And because of the way Hollywood is now that, you know, your people, your, your age, my agents work hard to get, to get auditions for me. Um, and uh, especially my theatrical agent, you know, to get an audition for a, a movie or, or whatever. Uh, so, uh, so they do a lot of work without getting paid for. Uh, but uh, I have, I have terrific, terrific representation. Uh, my, my agents and my manager, they're, they're all good, good people, uh, which is important to me. Uh, you know, the, the, the dollar is not the bottom line for me, and I think probably for most people. You need to get along with people, and the people who rep represent me need to be courteous and polite. And there are people, and it's legitimate, that have a different point of view. They want an attack dog, you know. Um, but uh, it's not comfortable for an actor to go in and then have a casting director say, boy, you're aging. You know, you got to tell them, back off. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable. But I'm in a, I'm in a great place where I, I have a wonderful representation and, and um, things are coasting, coasting along nicely. Is there anything, you, as you just explained, as things have changed in the entertainment industry, um, as with regards to your voice work, yeah. and uh, particularly to one role that uh, I really enjoyed from you as um, OG from uh, Legend of Black Heaven, what was it like during that course of time as things were changing in the business? Well, Legend of Black Heaven, I think that was my first one. Was that your first one? I think that was my first one. And I, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, OG, he, he saves the world with music. I mean, it's really terrific. It's, 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 uh, uh, but I'm trying to think. I was, I was very green at that time. Uh, but I remember I was really excited about doing that. It was really fun. It, it was, it was um, I don't know what's it called. White bread. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't edgy at all. You know, it just these guys doing their music, and because their music was saving the universe. Uh, and also, OG was uh, you probably remember he wasn't a deep voice guy. He was just like you know. So I was you know I was just talking like that. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. Thank you for bringing that up. That's that goes that goes hits me back. Then you back to the beginning of a journey that has been absolutely phenomenal. And meeting and, and spending time with people like, uh, you know, like Steve and Melissa and, and Mary Elizabeth and Wendy. Um, we don't see each other as much as we, we'd like to. Everybody's busy doing their own thing, you know. Um, but so that's one of the reasons why this is so special for us. I think this is the only second time, only the second time that we've been to a convention, uh, all of us at the same, at the same time. So it's, this is very special. You guys are making it wonderful for us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Follow up. All of your, your peers have uh, been with us. I assume as a surprise to you the most out of all of them. Like, who's the one? I mean, obviously there's the other one in the room, but anyone that really stood out as a surprise during the course of this, this road of voice Hmm, that's quite a question. That's a, that's, that's a hard one. I have to ruminate on that. Um, not too long ago, I did, uh, I did a session uh, as an orc. Are you guys familiar with the orcs? The World of Warcraft? Yeah, yeah. yeah they they're <laughs> Um, uh, there was one actor, I don't know if, I, I won't use his name, but 
he he has he has this mild voice like that, and he's a singer. And at this session, they have all deep voice guys. And some of them guys make me sound like a tenor. You know? <laughs> and uh, and he was he was there. And he was talking, and I had just met him, and I was just wondering. Hmm. Hmm. Is he going to, you know, is he going to cut it? And then when he did it, it was the most astonishing thing. It was like a completely different human being. He was down in his balls. <laughs> he was, I don't know what I was going to tell you. I was like, wow, man. I had to tell him, I said, you, you're impressive. You're impressive. Because he said, you sound like you're, you sing as a tenor. He said, yeah, yeah, actually. I do. I said, how do you get down there? I've just been working at it. You know, bringing it down, bringing it down, bring it, you know, just, just doing that. So because the voice, the voice is basically muscles and tendons. And so you, you know, with a reason, you can bring your voice down and bring your voice up. And that's why the, the, the apparatic tenors, you can see those guys, they work years to bring their voice, you know, bring their voices up, call their voices up. And some of them, like Pavarotti, when he was singing, you can see all that effort, you know, you see all that effort, but there are some of them uh, who sing you know, those very high notes with seem, seemingly little effort at all, you don't see any tension in here, but, you know, that's another mystery, uh, but um, I remember I did, uh, I revoiced the character in a movie, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the penitentiary movies, they're kind of a cult movie, they, uh, takes place in a penitentiary, um, you see, um, when I was on General Hospital, one of the actors there, he played Luke and Luke and Laura. You guys probably don't remember that anyway. But Tony Geary was his name. And so he decided to leave General Hospital and pursue a uh, you know, feature film career. And so he was doing the, this, this movie, uh, Penitentiary, and there, there were three of them. Right? And in the third one, they had um, a little person, uh, a Jamaican little person. Uh, who was in the penitentiary, and he was like supernatural. He could fly, you know. It was, it was really a fun. It was a fun uh, thing. But so they wanted me to revoice them because his voice was too high. They felt it was too high, so they wanted him to have a deep voice. And uh, it was really funny. But the interesting experience was that I, I voiced him. Let's see, eight hours a day for four days, and. He wanted me to go as deep as I could in my register, you know, and sound natural. And after three and a half days, he said, "No, I want him. I want him high like a monkey." <laughs> <laughs> I said, and by that time, I was like, "I don't think I can do high like a monkey." <laughs> <laughs> and it actually, became it became an issue. And I told him, I said, "Okay, well." I've been down in my bowels for, you know, for four days here, and if you want me to do a high voice, I can do it. I can do a high voice, but not after I've been down, you know, low for, for, four, for four days. And he didn't understand the, the instrument. He just, he just didn't understand the instrument. And uh, he said, so what's the big deal? I said, I, I can't explain it to you. You know, I can't explain it to you, but it, the, the voice is muscles. You know, it's, it's muscles, and, and your vocal bands vibrate. And the muscles pull and they stretch and all of this stuff. But he said, but um, you give me a week to recover from all of this, and then I can give you a high monkey. I said, but you're going to have to get somebody else. And, um, but, and I had just been, pretty much finished the role. And, uh, and then he just got that revelation. I said, I wish you had had that revelation like four days ago, and I could have given it to you. <laughs> but um, I don't know how I got on the penitentiary. I'm just, I'm just plugging my work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, you know, if you want, you want to just some, watch some silly, watch the penitentiary movies. They're, 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 silly, and, they're silly and fun. And I like silly and fun. Is that what you prefer when you do yeah, I, I, I do, uh, but I mean a lot of our, you know, a lot of our work, I mean it's tongue in cheek, you know, like, like Barrett or, um, but the video games are, you 
you know, they're, they've gotten like, they got serious, you know, and all the violence and, and, and all of that, so. Uh, but like, when, you know, when I go to the movies, I, um, if I had my choice, I'd want something silly and fun. Because, you know, like all of us, I guess we're affected by what we watch. And, you know, if you watch a dark, uh, you know, a, a dark, hideous movie, uh, it's a totally different, a different experience. And then, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of carry it with me. And um, so, and there are some movies that you just have to see them, even if they're bad. You know, you have to see them because they're like part of, they're part of the culture. Uh, but yeah, if I had my choice, I, you know, I just like, I like to laugh. You know, I mean, I prefer to laugh rather than to brood about, brood about stuff, especially in my time of life, too. Um, and I, you know, as I mentioned, my, my grandson was born uh, it was a Tuesday, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just like, I want no conflict in my life. Because as, as I said, that's one of the reasons I left the law, because, you know, if you're practicing law, it's just like constant, you know, this and that, and, you know, tell me, I know he's lying, okay, yeah, you'll get back to me, you're right, you know, and it's, you know, and, uh, you know and, and working 90 hours a week and in the library after a case, I would be in the library at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and in the military, they, they would schedule their cases out. And so sometimes they schedule a day for a case. And it would, you know, it would, it would take more than a day. And, but because of the scheduling, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have the courtroom available for another two months. So they say, okay, we're finishing this case. So we're in trial at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, I mean, we're human, so I'm not as sharp. I mean, I'm not as sharp after I've been working all day and constantly. You know, and you, you know, when you're concentrating, that's fatigue. When you really kind of, that's, that's fatigue. And, uh, and especially when you have so much on the line, somebody's freedom is on the line. And um, so it was, um, it was one of those situations where, and then, and then I would have a different case the next day. And if my research wasn't finished, I had to go to the library, and there I am, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. I had to be in court at 9 the next morning uh, on this case. Um, and, as I say, it's not, just, it's not just busy work, because even though uh, that my trial partner and I, we got along well, we still, once we were in that courtroom, you know, it was like, it was a matter of pride as, as, as anything else. I want to do the best job I can for my client, you know. Uh, and friendship doesn't enter into it at all, and, and he would pull some fast ones on me, and uh, so you know, I pull some fast ones on him too. I get back at him, uh, but there's a there's because I ended up as I said when I first started I was defense counsel, and then when I got really sharp and really good they made me prosecute. <laughs> so so. Uh, there's a different mentality when you're representing a human being versus representing the government, United States versus somebody. And, uh, and that was one of the things that, that, that uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're working as a prosecutor, I'm working for, for personal and professional pride, doing the best job I can. But as a defense lawyer, I'm trying, I'm doing the best I can for a human being. And, um, and, it, and it, it, uh, it doesn't matter whether he's, he's guilty or innocent, uh, which is a legal determination anyway, because sometimes there's a fine line. I had a friend of mine who was uh, castigating me because you represented guilty people, didn't you? I said, well, you know, sometimes that's not always cut and dry. That's why you have juries or hung juries, and people have differences of opinion. I said, but even if it's a, he's a guilty person, he has a right to uh, a, a fair trial. He has a right to uh, the prosecution um, proving the case against him. And it's, there's no, because he was accusing me of having a, la a, a lack of integrity. You know, and I said, no, it's not at all. It's about our judicial system uh, affords everyone a right to come to counsel. Um, and that's my job, to do the best I can. Because I said, if you came to me and, and you, you want me to represent you, you want me to do that too, right? Even if you, you, you feel in your mind that you're guilty, he said, well, yeah. Okay, that's 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 what we're talking about. Uh, because sometimes people get down on 
on some of the attorneys who represent the uh, um, some of the terrorists. Um, and I mean, I understand. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but I understand the guys who do it and to say, well, these these they're they're hideous people in your mind, but they are also entitled to uh, a fair trial. And, and that's I think that that's uh, the an element of of, of uh, civilized society, that that's the way we, we proceed, because uh, they have a saying in the law, you rather uh, let ten guilty guys go free rather than convict one innocent man. And um, I feel it's a very profound uh, case, and because, because of DNA, you probably, you, you, we've had a lot of these cases now where people have been in jail for 15, 20 years, and then the DNA proves them innocent. Well, uh, unfortunately, what the whole Guantanamo incident about a year ago, when it was revealed that 30% of the prisoners were innocent, mm -hmm. uh, Dick Cheney came out and said the opposite of that. Well, he said know. he would rather keep, or have 10 men in jail as long as one of them was guilty. Well, you know, I guess he's entitled to his opinion, but <laughs> think about that. You know, people's lives, I mean, these guys have spent, literally spent 20 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. I mean, wow. So, sorry, I have a question, but this is a little serious, I don't know how to carry it down. Is there, like, any sort of, like, process, like, it's like, if I'm in jail for 20 years, or if I'm in jail for 20 years, like, what is the government going to deal with it? How is the government going to deal with it? How do what? How is the government going to deal with a case like that? Well, they just... We have seven minutes. Okay. Um, the government, you know, they have a couple of organizations that look into look into to that. The Innocence Project. Um, Sheck, who was one of the uh, defense lawyers for O.J. Simpson, he started a program. So that they 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 go and investigate these cases where uh, to find out because a lot of you know a lot of guys in prison saying I'm innocent too, you know, but when they're not. But if there's a way to prove it, um, and, and we, we find out there that he had he had in common counsel, there was a case in Texas where his lawyer was falling asleep in court. I mean, so he obviously didn't have common counsel. But uh, if if the evidence comes up, you know, with DNA, these guys are being released. Uh, so um, I mean, that's that's all we can do, and I think they can give them reparations. Hopefully, they would. I don't know if that. That happens. It goes. It varies from state to state. But you know, if you took a, you took 20 years of a lot of a guy's life, and that's happened to a lot of a lot of African Americans in the South, uh, where there was rushes, r rush to judgment, and these guys are found guilty, and then witnesses recount, well, I, I really lied, you know, 20 years ago or something, and um, and I don't know, I don't know what's which states, you know, give them. You know, pay them for the time, it's the 20 years that they lost. But I feel that something should happen. I mean, just, I, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I just can't imagine spending 20 years in. So many of these guys that come out saying, I, I don't have any bitterness. I don't know how that happens. And I'm thinking, you got to be just talking. But, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I think that also for their, own, for their own mental health, you know, they say, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hold the grudge. That's, that's what it is. But, uh, that's the way the government handles it. If you come up with enough evidence, and usually it's DNA. I mean, yeah. that's sometimes it's a witness who recants and said, "Well, actually, I lied," but it's usually DNA. And because uh, there have been cases where witnesses recant and they, the, the government does nothing, the prosecutor doesn't do anything. He says, "Ah, he's guilty anyway." So, but the DNA is is, is, a, is a wonderful tool to, to help uh, purge our prisons of guys who didn't commit those crimes. Yes. Well, Jed is like like me, you know. With the, the, the Faye and, and, and Spike are like my kids, you know. <laughs> you remember that episode where Faye stole all the Wulongs and then <laughs> and then called for help. <laughs> and Jed, I, you got to get me out of this, you know. Um, not that my daughter is like that, but uh, <laughs> uh, and I have great kids. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah Jed, 
Jeff is kind of a family figure, a, a father figure to them, and, you know, and he always, and he really leaves them, but he pretends that he doesn't, <laughs> you know, he's, like when they all walk doing their thing, and it's just me and I, and I'm talking to I, and saying, I don't need them, <laughs> why do I need them, and then I hear a noise, Spike, is that you? <laughs> you back? Um, now, Raikage is, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's an interesting character. He's, he's like a, he's all blustery, you know? He's all blustery, and I, I don't think he has the vulnerability that Jet has. Right? Jet, because of, the, because of the way the show is set, Jet can show his vulnerability and his dependence on uh, you know, fame. You know, the, the whole gang, people being their head, and, and even even I, because uh, I lends a tender ear sometimes <laughs> to, to Jet. Uh, but Raikage, you know, he's he's blustery and he's he's um, uh, has to figure out what to do with his ne'er do well brother B. You know, who's always been. I actually I love to do B. Yeah. I don't know if you know the show, but you know. Hey, what's up? It's cool. It's cool. Everything's cool. <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's cool? That's cool, B. Yeah, they're, they're different, uh, different characters, and I really love doing both of them. Um, uh, and the nice thing about uh, Raikage, fourth Raikage, is that you know, he's, he's still alive and still cooking. You know, uh, I like, love the fact that Naruto is still going. Uh, I, I wish Watanabe would bring Cabo Bebop back, and uh, boy, would we love that. Because, you know, we did the game. We watched the game. But it never aired. I don't know why. We never got any explanations or anything. But we actually voiced the, the Kamala Bebop game. So, but you know, another lifetime.